Hello, James. Hey, hello. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Have you done Zoom before? I'm Dr. I'm Dr. Bennett, John Bennett. Have you done Zoom before? Uh, yeah, I believe so. I've done oh, Zoom. You wanna, run through, you wanna run through anything? Yeah, just quickly. Um, sure. What do you think of this background versus this one? Okay. <laughs> Let me unpin my video. So, okay. That's a nice background. As opposed to this one. Well, I'm partial to the brain. Okay. Yeah, I believe so. I've done. Yeah, that's recording. So, okay. We're just setting up here. We'll probably, we have like 25 here now. We'll probably have between 50 and 75 in the panel. Okay. See, what I would like is if your friend saw this and said, hey, I want to jump in and, you know, say something, mm -hmm. uh, we, it'll reach that point. But okay. uh, it's just becoming uh, mainstream now, yeah. as you know, as you know. Thank you for setting this up. Yeah, it's anytime. Great educational activity. Yeah. Yeah, it's popular in, in Africa. They love it in Africa, man, um, South America, but now the United States, which is di different than before. Yeah. Definitely different. So just give me, just give me a minute, okay? I'll be okay. back. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, about seven minutes, James. Okay, great. Okay. Do you want to just test if my slides are working? Yeah, there? sure. Sure. Movies? Okay. Sure. So let's see. Open up my PowerPoint. Close out my other ones here. So how do I go? I share screen. Is that what I do? Right, exactly. Yeah. Click on that and pick a, pick one of the six screens to capture the screen, and then you go where you want to go for your PowerPoint. Which what's the difference between enter full screen and maximize zoom? Uh, geez, I don't know. <laughs> Pick, uh, did you, did you open the screen share and six screens came, right? Uh, let's see, where's the screen share button? I think. At the bottom, at the very bottom, the middle. Oh, I see it. Yeah. I'm, see, on, click, I'm, on, yeah. I'm on settings here. That's why. No, 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 no. Share screen. Click on the share screen. Oh, okay. Got it. And then just open. And you, there you go. Okay, there you go. You got your PowerPoint and you know how to make it bigger, right? Yeah. I think there's some kind of option. Everyone is different. There you go. So you see it now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, you can get off that so I can introduce you first and then you, you, you go to your PowerPoint. Okay. Let me just. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. You got any videos? Yeah. I, I have a lot of videos here. Actually. Okay. Any sound in the videos? I don't think so. Okay, so I'll, I'll disable that option of the sound playing on the video. Now the right bottom hand corner of the slide, I'm not able to see. Okay. Covered by the panelists. Uh, you may have to decrease the size in the, in oh, the, uh, the PowerPoint, in the PowerPoint setting, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. There's no hurry. You can do that if you want. Looks like it's playing. You take your time. Are you happy with that or you want to change it? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy. Okay, it looks fun to me. Let me just see if there's one more. Yeah, we, yeah we, got, we got time, we got time. We got time, okay. Is this Zoom meeting password protected or? Uh, this meeting, um, 
Well, it's as protected as any Zoom is. Okay. Uh, people can enter, uh, you know, it's public, it's a public link to come in. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't had any problems in, in about three years of using it. Yeah. As far as uh, just one, one time, I think it was hijacked, but that was brief. But knock on wood, I haven't had any of the problems that you hear about. Okay, you want to make that bigger? Yeah, I'm just going to see what happens if I change yeah. my setting okay. here. Okay. Looks about the same to me. Yeah, it does look the same. Want to go back and try again? Yeah, go back and try again. Because I know there's like a 10%, 100%, 80%. You know what I mean? Yeah. Most programs they have that, so we just got to find it. I, so this is okay. This is okay. It's not like there's critical stuff on this side of the screen. No, no. Let's try it. Let's try it. We got a few minutes, but let's try it. If it doesn't work, we'll just come back. Somewhere up in the right, uh, up in the top, upper left, I think there's some kind of. Uh, so there's got to be some kind of setting up there. Transitions, animation, slideshow. Try the slideshow. Is, does it have any uh, presenters view? Uh, Want to try the presenter view? See what happens. Go in the presenter view. See what happens. Is that any different to you? Is that any different? Or well, I can see my my next slide on deck. Okay. What do you see? Do you see my presenter view or do you see that? I see, yeah, I see the slide on deck too, which is, I, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if you like it. Do you like it? If not, just well, go back to the- Well, I, I don't want the audience to see that. I, okay, okay. I'll just stick with this. This is fine. Okay. okay. So I'll just, I'll just leave it like this, right? Okay, just get off the screen chair while I introduce you first, okay? okay. Got it. And then you just go back on. Okay, here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach, uh, home of Neurosurgical TV. Today we have the pleasure of having Jane Bleu, neurosurgeon from Rutgers, New Jersey, and I'll let him explain his background and his topic. Welcome, James, and thank you. Great. Thank you, John. I uh, appreciate this opportunity. Um, let me share my screen here. Well, today I'm going to speak on the topic of pituitary tumors and paracellular skull-based lesions. And I'm going to talk about when we use the microscopic approach versus the endoscopic approach. And uh, I'm currently a professor of neurosurgery at Rutgers Health, RWJ Barnabas Health in New Jersey. And I practice cerebrovascular skull base and pituitary surgery in my center. And so today I'm going to dispel some of the myths on choosing the optimal approach. So access to the pituitary region is not anything new. We've uh, been doing this for over a century now, and you can see as early as uh, the early 1900s, uh, many surgeons have sought for the best route to the area of the paracellar region of the skull base. And uh, Cushing was one of the early pioneers and um, you can see in this example of this patient he had of acromegaly, he initially accessed the area of the cellar, cella through this transfacial incision called the omega incision. You can see there's a skin incision right on the forehead in the shape of the Greek letter uh, omega. And this allowed him to flap down into the ethmoid region where he then accessed the sphenoid sinus. He then later uh, transition to a sublabial incision, which is the more traditional incision that we're all familiar with. And notice how he visualized this dark region with just a flashlight uh, on his forehead. He then later pursued transcranial approaches through this frontal orbital approach. And you could see this is the earliest, uh, one of the earliest descriptions of an orbital frontal approach, uh, removing the orbital rim to get lower on the skull base. And many others such as Krause and Frazier uh, also were proponents of this approach. Uh, 
And because of his interest in transcranial approaches, he nearly abandoned transnasal surgery by the 1930s. But if it wasn't for his pupils, uh, namely Norman Dott from Scotland, Guillaume from Paris, who then passed the technique on to Jules Hardy, it was this lineage of his, tra of his trainees that preserved the art of transphenoidal surgery. And so Jules Hardy is credited for introducing the microscope as well as the sea arm fluoroscope to help localize the region as he was uh, removing these tumors. And he also popularized the idea of selective adenomectomy in Cushing's disease. And it was in the late 80s, uh, Dr. Weiss from USC popularized the extended transphenol approach by simply mobilizing the nasal speculum superiorly to get to the planum or inferiorly towards the clival region. And we call that the extended transphenodal approaches. And then later uh, in the late 90s, Professor Joe at Pittsburgh uh, was one of the earliest um, pioneers of endoscopic pituitary surgery. And then the work by Kassam, uh, Gardner, Snyderman and others uh, popularized the extended approaches where we get through the sagittal plane from the frontal sinus down to the craniocervical junction, as well as lateral out into the lateral corridors of the cavernous sinus, middle fossa and infratemporal fossa. So the workhorse for the, um, I lost my screen here, John. That's, okay, the workhorse uh, for the uh, paracellar endoscopic approach is really for the transcellular corridor. I'm sorry, James. I'm sorry to interrupt you. It's not on now. The, the, you fell off the screen chair. I did. Okay. Thanks yeah. for letting me know. You just go back. Perfect. Okay. So the workhorse for the endoscopic approaches is primarily through the transcellular corridor for pituitary tumors. And of course, um, we can expand these uh, approaches to other corridors from the cribriform down to the craniocervical junction. And of course, we can get to uh, all areas of the ventral skull base uh, and uh, look at the uh, basal artery and suprachiasmatic region as well. So pituitary tumors are the workhorse uh, for these lesions. These uh, account for 10 to 15% of all primary brain tumors and are the third most common primary intracranial tumor behind gliomas and meningiomas. And they're more common than we think. According to some autopsy reports, we can see about one in four or one in five in the general population will have a pituitary tumor. Of course, not all of these come to medical attention. How do they present? Well, they can present when they hypersecrete a hormone, such as prolactin growth hormone or ACTH, or they can present with pituitary insufficiency. And of course, when they get large enough, they can cause mass effect on the visual apparatus causing bitemporal hemianopsia. And in some occasions, they can have spontaneous hemorrhage or infarction where the patient presents with an acute headache, typically associated with visual loss and double vision with oculomotor deficits. And this is pituitary tumor apoplexy. Uh, this is a, a case of a 52-year-old male who presented exactly with those symptoms. And it's important to check their pituitary blood work prior because most of them will typically have low cortisol levels and they come in with an Addisonian crisis. So you must quickly administer intravenous hydrocortisone and then get your imaging. And the typical imaging findings we see are on a pre-gadolinium T1 scan, you can see bright signal that we call T1 shortening. And this is typically uh, significant for blood products. And then after gadolinium administration, you'll see that the tumor, you'll see that the tumor barely enhances or, does, or doesn't enhance at all. And this is very typical of findings of pituitary apoplexy. Sometimes you can see sphenoid sinus mucosal thickening, and that can be a tip off that you're dealing with an acute episode of apoplexy. And the treatment typically is uh, urgent to emergent transphenoidal resection or decompression. And this is a, a view of the tumor endoscopically. You can see the sphenoid sinus has been widened. The tumor here appears necrotic, uh, 
and white. It's a very ischemic looking tumor. And uh, when the tumor fills the sphenoid sinus, one trick that I typically use is find the layer of the sphenoid mucosa. This is typically a nice surgical handle that you can pick up the tumor and then follow it back to the cellar opening. And then when you clean out the cella, look for the cellar barrier. And in this case, this cellar barrier. John, can you ask the audience to mute their microphones? I'm sorry about that. Go ahead. Okay. So you typically want to look for the cellar barrier. And in this case, the cellar barrier here is the arachnoid membrane covered by a thin layer of gland. And oftentimes there will be a thin layer of gland, but sometimes it'll be just pure arachnoid, but this is the cellar barrier. Some people call this the diaphragm, but you look for the descent of this. And this gives you confidence that you've decompressed the optic chiasm and the CSF pressures have uh, pushed out the tumor. And so this is the immediate post-op MRI. You can see that the chiasm here in the coronal view has been decompressed and the optic, I'm sorry, the pituitary stalk here has remained intact with a thin layer of gland. I'm sorry, once again. Oh. Trying to get that. Oh, can you mute, please? I can't. Oh, I'm looking for that person. Okay. Okay, James. Okay. Okay. Great. Sorry Thank about you. that. That's all right. This is another example of apoplexy in a Cushing's patient. You can see the chiasm has been compressed and the gland has been uh, pushed off to the left side of the patient. And after tumor removal, you can see the gland and the stalk has been preserved and it, it is indeed veering off to the left side. How do we uh, work these pituitary tumors up? Typically, we like to get an MRI uh, of the pituitary region, three millimeter slices with and without gadolinium. It's important to get pituitary function labs and neuro-ophthalmological testing with formal visual fields. Uh, it's important to ask in your history whether there's been enlargement of hands and feet, changes of facial features, whether they have diabetes, hypertension, or weight loss, and so forth. And you're looking for signs of any endocrinopathies in these patients. Uh, this is the typical panel that we typically get in the endocrine workup, the full panel of anterior pituitary hormone uh, axis. And of course, uh, neuro-ophthalmological exam with formal visual field testing is very important in the workup. So here's an example. This is a cystic pituitary adenoma. You can see there's a large cyst with a bright T2 signal, mostly filled with fluid. Uh, in this case, the workup was non-functioning for the patient presented with visual loss. And we did this through an endoscopic transphenodal approach. The cellar floor has been opened. And we'll now go ahead and open up the dura mater over the, the tumor. And I typically like to separate the dura from the pseudocapsule of the tumor. And we'll quickly eventually here enter the cyst cavity to decompress the cyst. So we're just gonna grab a, a portion of the, the tumor wall. And so you can see the straw colored cyst fluid come out. And oftentimes in these cystic tumors, you will find soft tumor along the wall of the cyst. So don't be fooled by the MRI if you don't see nodular enhancement, but typically there will be tumor along the cyst wall. There typically can be soft and suckable. And here we're using a two-handed technique, like we're doing two-handed microsurgery, carefully dissecting the tumor from the arachnoid and from the normal gland. And this is how you can avoid an intraoperative CSF leak using two-handed microsurgery. And I often like to use a 30 degree angled scope looking upwards, looking for uh, the descent of the arachnoid membrane. Now, when you have a very large tumor like this macroadenoma, notice how the cellar barrier is gonna be quite large and stretched. So you'll have a very redundant cellar barrier that's folded on itself. And I typically like to explore these folds to make sure there's no hidden tumor within these folds of arachnoid. And you can do this uh, with this, uh, what I call inside out technique, where we're basically flopping the arachnoid membrane from inside to outside. And you can see it's now bulging through this, the dural mater 
and then we can reduce it back and push it back in uh, with a cellar repair. Here you can see the immediate post-op MRI, the stock and the gland here has been preserved. The chiasm has been decompressed and he had normal pituitary function postoperatively. Again, here's the chiasm, here's the stock and here's the gland. Now here's another example of a, a macroadenoma. Um, what's important is you have to rely on the CSF pressure to push these tumors out. Some practitioners may opt to use a lumbar drain. And if you do, I would advise that you don't open the lumbar drain early. Resist the temptation to open that lumbar drain early on because you need the CSF pressures. And sometimes I'll use a Valsalva technique. Sometimes you can inject sterile saline through the drain. But here in this case, just normal CSF pressures happen to push the tumor out. So after some internal debulking, Luckily, this tumor was quite soft and suckable. Notice how the CSF pressures continue to push out the tumor with the pseudocapsule. So now it's got a nice pseudocapsule. We're able to come around the tumor. I use a blunt uh, ring curette so I don't uh, violate the tumor capsule and I don't violate the tumor arachnoid above the tumor. And simply the CSF pressures here will push out the tumor. And um, Using gentle suction, I use a, typically a, a seven French Fukushima suction where I can control the strength of the suction so I don't suck on the arachnoid membrane and get an intraoperative CSF leak. And again, we, we're gonna look for that descent of the cellar barrier. And in this case, it's gonna be the arachnoid membrane with a thin layer of gland over the membrane. And so in the absence of a CSF leak intraop, we repair it simply with a piece of alloderm graft. This takes literally 10 seconds to do. You just cut a square of this graft and put it up against the skull base and we'll bolster it with surges cell and gel foam. And here's the immediate post-op scan. You can see restoration of the enhancing stock. And if you follow the enhancing stock, you'll see the normal gland. So here's the normal gland. And again, the chiasm is well decompressed. And, in, and oftentimes the patients will tell you in the recovery room that they can already see better. And in this case, the patient was able to see the clock across the room that she wasn't able to see before. So is tumor size a limit for using the endoscopic approach for large tumors such as this that goes all the way up to the third ventricle and foramen of Monroe? And I would say, I would say not. I, you can still use endonasal approaches. Sometimes you have to extend it through a transplantum approach, as in this case, we're able to dissect the tumor off the optic chiasm and see the frame of Monroe and third ventricle, and we can reconstruct this area with a nasoceptal flap. And of course, this tumor was quite invasive into the cavernous sinuses, and in non-functioning tumors, uh, I'll have a low threshold to leave a residual in the cavernous sinus and treat this with radiosurgery, which we did in this case. Here's another example of a large tumor extending anteriorly and superiorly. So in this case, we did a transplantum approach to get anterior to this and decompress the optic chiasm. And so we must remember the physiology if we're gonna do pituitary surgery. We also must know our pituitary physiology and of course, you're aware of the prolactin basal secretion and that is inhibited by dopamine. So when tumors enlarge and compress the pituitary stock, you inhibit the dopamine uh, inhibition and you get a elevated prolactin level, typically between 50 to 100, but usually no more than that. So when the prolactin level is, is greater than 100 or 150 and you have a larger tumor, uh, you must have suspicion that it's a prolactin secreting tumor or prolactinoma. Here is an example of a patient who had this large macroadenoma with a prolactin of 65. So when I look at this value, this looks like stock effect, stock compression effect and not a prolactinoma. Unfortunately, this patient was treated by an outside practitioner assuming it was a prolactinoma and was treated on bromocryptine for a number of years. You can see the tumor has not shrunk and has remained large and actually began to grow in size causing visual compression. And so we went ahead and removed this. And of course the pathology was a non-functioning adenoma. So be aware of interpretation of the prolactin values.
and of course we can go laterally into uh, la uh, lateral um, corridors and this is a cadaver dissection showing the paraclival carotid artery uh, entering the cavernous carotid and these are the nerves in the cavernous sinus so if a pituitary tumor extends into the cavernous sinus my philosophy has generally been uh, if the tumor is soft, you can follow it into the cavernous sinus uh, and treat the residual with radiosurgery. But in some instances, there can be exceptions, such as this case. This is a recurrent adenoma. The patient has been operated on at a other center for, uh, several times and continues to have this recurrent tumor. And in this case, it was causing progressive ophthalmoplegia. So in this case, my goal was to decompress those cranial nerves and uh, instead of coming through a transcranial corridor, I came in through an endonasal corridor because if you look at the coronal view, the paraclival carotid artery lends a safe window lateral to the carotid. And it's important that you use uh, CTA image guidance and intraoperative Doppler monitoring to map out the carotid. And uh, if the tumor is soft, you can follow the tumor uh, out into the cavernous sinus. Now in this case, beware that you can get into a small perforator of the meningohypophyseal trunk. And uh, you can be easily fooled into thinking this is a carotid injury, but you can see it's not very high flow. It's just a pinpoint and it can be readily controlled with just gentle surgicel packing. And once that's under control, we can then Doppler out where the carotid is, Doppler out a safe zone, confirm it on image guidance. And then we'll open up the lateral periosteum over the safe zone of the tumor. And you have to do it incrementally. I always palpate with a dissector to make sure it's a safe zone before making a cut. And then if the tumor is soft, just allow the tumor to make the corridor for you. So there is the paraclival carotid. This is the carotid artery back here. And then we'll, we'll extend the dural opening from the cavernous to the cellar opening. And now we have full view of this cavernous carotid and we'll use curved suctions to get out laterally into this region and to decompress those nerves in the cavernous sinus. And there's no intraoperative CSF leak, so I'll just gently um, pack the defect with the uh, surgicel and a alloderm uh, patch graft. And so here's the post-op scan. Her cranial nerve palsy is improved. Uh, she had some residual here that I ended up treating with uh, radiosurgery and she's done quite well. So how about Cushing's disease? Cushing's disease uh, are uh, notorious uh, for causing very bad medical ailments in patients and the tumors are typically small. So even small tumors can cause very bad things. This is a patient with uh, Cushing syndrome with the, uh, this is the myriad of symptoms that you're all familiar with. And of course the uh, physiology behind this is hypersecretion of ACTH from the anterior lobe that then acts on the adrenal cortex to secrete cortisol. And in these abnormal states, you have hypersecretion of cortisol, which is, uh, causes the detriment of these patients. So in this case, if you study the film carefully, the gland is, will be located on the left side of the cella and the tumor, which is slightly darker, will be on the right side. And I look for this intraoperatively. You can see here, we make a small incision in the gland and then we start to come around the pseudo capsule of the tumor. I try to use the pseudo capsular dissection technique that was described and popularized by Professor Oldfield. And um, sometimes the tumor doesn't always come out in one piece. As in this case, um, I had to debulk it because sometimes there's not enough room to come all the way around. So uh, if you do do it in piecemeal fashion, uh, as long as you maintain a, uh, uh, a good surface area of the pseudocapsule, you can still come around the tumor carefully. Now, Cushing's patients, it's uh, very uh, often you can get cavernous bleeding because these tumors will abut the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. So if you do encounter cavernous bleeding, don't panic. You can just use gel foam or Surgicel and gentle packing. And with the endoscope, we can look inside here. And this is the normal gland. This is the posterior lobe, and we were able to find a small residual and remove that. And you can see this is the cellar barrier. It's an arachnoid membrane with a CSF leak, in which case we'll repair it with a nasoceptal flap. 
uh, to repair the CSF leak. And what you want to look for postoperatively is a postoperative day one growth hormone, I'm sorry, cortisol level of less than two to three. And in this case, it was 1.5. And this is very, uh, uh, optim very promising and optimistic for a potential uh, biochemical cure. Of course, you have to follow these patients long term. You can have late recurrences. And in this case, you can see the patient here at six months, dramatic physical transformation from her prior Cushing's state. And this is probably one of the most rewarding aspects of doing Cushing's disease surgery. Here's another example of a young woman who began having progressive weight gain. She used to look like this and was a, an athlete who worked out frequently and then over some years uh, developed this uh, picture. And luckily her internist was um, sharp enough to detect and test for Cushing's. And after her Cushing's surgery, she uh, reverted back to her normal state. Let's talk a little bit about acromegaly. We see it frequently in the media uh, with celebrities. And of course, you know that uh, it is the excess of growth hormone secretion from the anterior gland that then acts on the liver to secrete IGF-1. And it is IGF-1 that goes on to act upon the soft tissues and bones that causes enlargement. But the danger here is uh, enlargement of the heart causing cardiomyopathy and cardiomegaly and diabetes. So we must treat these since these are malignant endocrinopathies. This is an 82 year old female who presented with diabetes and hypertension, enlarged hands and feet with an elevated IGF-1 and growth hormone. Look at the frontal bossing, enlarged jaw, enlarged hands, and they typically have a deep voice and here the tumor is quite small. Notice how the stalk ends with the gland and the small tumor is right here just below the normal gland. And this was readily removed endoscopically. And what we typically look for is a, uh, a low growth hormone uh, on uh, post-op day one. And you can see uh, he had normalization uh, of growth hormone. So we look for the growth hormone level uh, less than two on post-op day one. This was uh, based on a paper from Dr. Weiss and Dr. Coldwell at USC. And when the growth hormone level on post-op day one uh, is less than two, it usually signifies a good, uh, good chance of long-term biochemical cure. And so here the stalk and gland has been preserved. And you can see on a delayed post-op photograph, uh, he's got some shrinkage of his uh, hands and feet and facial features. So if the IGF-1 is persistently elevated, uh, what are the options uh, after that? Well, I typically wait somewhere between three to six months at the IGF-1 level. They take some time to normalize. Um, but we always like to do an oral glucose tolerance test to make sure it's not a falsely elevated IGF-1 level. But if it is truly elevated IGF-1 with residual tumor, then we have other medical therapies with somatostatin analogs and sometimes using growth hormone receptor antagonists to treat these. And of course, if there's any uh, physical radiographic tumor you can identify, you should treat these with radiosurgery. Now, let's take a look at this large tumor. This is a 37-year-old male with bitemporal hemianopsia with this large tumor. What would be the best surgical approach for this giant invasive tumor? And um, I know uh, I've asked this in many panels and I've gotten a number of answers of extended approaches or transcranial approaches or transtemporal approaches. But I think we always have to remember to take a step back whenever we see a paracellar region lesion, uh, we got to remember to check the prolactin level. And in this case, it was 35. But you must remember to ask your laboratory to dilute the prolactin because you can get a falsely low prolactin called a hook effect because the assay uh, involves antibodies where the binding sites get saturated in largely elevated prolactin levels. And then you end up getting a false low prolactin level. So you have to dilute it. And if you recalculate it, this prolactin level was over 35,000. So this patient doesn't need the, the, uh, the neurosur need a neurosurgical procedure. Uh, 
uh, you can treat this with medical therapy. And he responded uh, very nicely to bromocryptin therapy. You can see the tumor is com nearly completely melted away and he's done quite well now for about eight years. So the treatment for prolactinomas is medical, bromocryptine or cabergoline. We typically reserve surgery for uh, medically refractory cases that don't respond to medical therapy or if the patient has adverse uh, side effects. And then in some cases, uh, if the tumor is small and if it is focal radiographically in a young patient, I sometimes will offer them primary surgery or secondary surgery if they fail medical therapy. And we've published a paper on this that this is, if you can cure these over 90% with a low complication risk of less than 1%, this strategy can be more cost effective than lifelong medical therapy. And this was published in World Nurse Surgery about four years ago. But in this case, this is a 22 year old female with this tumor and she absolutely refused medical therapy. Her prolactin level is 178. So I believe if the prolactin level is typically less than three to 400 with a focal tumor like this, that's not invading the cavernous sinus, you can potentially cure these much like the way we do for Cushing's disease. So here is the tumor and we are able to separate it from the normal gland and the normal gland here has been preserved. And you can see the prolactin level post-op day one is five. What we typically look for is a post-op day one prolactin level of less than 10. And it, if, if it is less than 10, you have a very high chance, greater than 95% that you have achieved uh, long-term biochemical remission. And again, this paper was also published out from USC by Dr. Weiss uh, back in the uh, early 2000s. So let's expand a little bit and talk about other corridors we can access endonasally. Um, the transplanum corridor, uh, which is this region right here in the suprachiasmatic retrochiasmatic area, has been, uh, I would say, a game changer for the management of craniopharyngiomas. And craniopharyngiomas typically will have a retrochiasmatic location, meaning they're located underneath and behind the chiasm and often adherent to the hypothalamus extending into the third ventricle. And this area has been uh, difficult to see from an approach from above, but from below, we have this advantage of being able to visualize the undersurface of the optic nerves, chiasm and perforators and the hypothalamus. So we published uh, our uh, paradigm in choosing the optimal surgical approach for these lesions some years ago. And in this case, this is a pediatric patient with a large craniopharyngioma that presents itself to the cella. And in this case, you can come in from below endoscopically. Here, uh, we're dissecting the tumor. And um, it's important to dissect in the plane between the tumor arachnoid and the true tumor capsule. And once you dissect the tumor off the hypothalamus, you have this great view of the optic chiasm, the hypothalamus. And it's important to preserve the integrity of the liliquous membrane because this will help you protect those basilar perforators. And then the repair will typically use uh, autologous fascia lata, double layered, followed by a nasal septal flap. And you can see this patient had a complete removal, decompression of the optic chiasm. He did require hormone replacement therapy, but he's been remission free for roughly seven years now. And he's, he's now an adult and doing quite well. What I look for on the sagittal T2 is I'll look for where the location of the chiasm is. And this is where the yellow dot signifies. And I look at the different corridors. Here you see the translamina terminalis corridor, which is between the ACOM complex and the chiasm. And here the infrachiasmatic window is quite narrow. The tumor does not present itself to the cella. Here's the normal gland. And the stock is probably here and it, the stock has probably been expanded. So in this case, instead of coming from below, which is also an option, I decided to come from above because I felt that the lamina terminalis window was larger. And when we do this, I typically prefer a midline approach, transbasal approach, because if you come in through an anterolateral, terional, or orbitozygomatic, your view of the lamina terminalis is oblique and your opening is oblique. And so you have a blind spot on the ipsilateral optic nerve 
and you won't be able to see this wall of the ependema. Whereas a midline approach, you have great view of both walls of the third ventricle. So this is the video showing the subfrontal translamina terminalis approach. You open up the thin layer of the lamina terminalis and identify the tumor capsule. And after some debulking of the tumor, you come around it extracapsularly, dissect it off of the walls of the third ventricle. And it's important to use sharp dissection. There's the view of the basal artery. And of course, um, we must remember that when you come from above, it looks great, but there will always be a blind spot underneath this area of the chiasm. Now you can try to use endoscopes transcranially or angled dental mirrors to look for this area, but it's very difficult to dissect this area because it's, it is a, a blind spot. And so although um, our initial post-operative scan looks very favorable, um, you must monitor these patients long-term because you can have delayed recurrences that you see here. And this, I believe, was due to those blind spot areas that was difficult to see from above. But they're very sensitive to radiation, so we treated it with radiation therapy, and he's been uh, progression-free for roughly seven years now. So this is the view from above of the chiasm, and this is the view from below. So why is the endoscopic approach favorable for these tumors? And again, I say that you can see the undersurface of the visual apparatus, so you can perform safe dissection and get better visual outcomes. Now here's a large tumor associated with this large solid component, retrochiasmatic solid tumor, and then this large frontal lobe cyst causing significant mass effect shift and some, some early hydrocephalus. So I debated which approach I would do. Um, I would considered coming transcranially first, uh, but in this case, I decided to come in endonasally first because I felt that it would be safer to get um, to not injure the, the optic chiasm with an approach from below. And if I had to, I can always come in second stage transcranially if needed. So here is the surgical approach. Uh, use a high speed diamond drill to thin down the planum and the tuberculum. And then you out fracture it with an up angled curette and typically in some cases, I'll decompress the medial optic nerve canals on both sides. We then open the dura over the cellar floor and then continue it into the dura of the planum. And you will have to coagulate the intracavernous sinus uh, before you do that. Now, when I dissect these tumors, I always look for the carotid artery as it exits the distal dural ring. So here's the proximal carotid. And then here's the optic nerve on the left side. And so this is all two-handed microsurgery. This is the right optic nerve. Here's the right optic nerve. And then we'll go ahead and debulk the tumor. This is just the solid component of the tumor. Now, when you look for the proximal carotid, look for these small perforators medially. These are not tumor feeders, these are superior hypophyseal feeders going back towards the chiasm. So if you coagulate this and divide it, you will probably risk visual loss in this patient postoperatively. So try to preserve those perforators. Here we use sharp dissection to free them up. Now to look for the stalk, I typically will lift the tumor up and look above the gland. And here you see the portal striations of the normal pituitary stalk. Now, if I can preserve the stock, I will, I will attempt to preserve the stock. But in some cases, of course, the tumor may expand the stock and invade it. And in those cases, you sometimes have to sacrifice the stock to get the tumor out. But in this case, I determined that I was not able to get a complete removal of the tumor, namely because if you look at the ACOM complex here, it is completely encased and invaded by this tumor cyst wall. And it's like peeling off wallpaper here. And this is where you can injure, cause a neurovascular injury. So I've already determined I can't get a complete removal, but I can try to get a near total removal. You see how the right optic nerve here is actually encased by the tumor capsule here? This is what forms that cyst wall. So the tumor goes over the right optic nerve into the right frontal lobe cyst. And here's the recurrent artery of Huebner. 
Here's a very thin ACOM. So I need to disconnect the cyst wall here, disconnect the solid tumor from the cyst wall. And once I've done that, I freed up the right optic nerve. And now I can go ahead and remove this solid component of the tumor in the retrochiasmatic region. Here's the right PCOM. Here's the right P1. And this is the membrane of Liliquist. So in majority of craniopharyngioma cases, these tumors will respect the membrane of Liliquist. And you must try to preserve that membrane because this will help avoid any vascular injuries of the basilar perforators. You must use two-handed microsurgery sharp dissection. We're using sharp dissection here to dissect the tumor off of the hypothalamus, off of the pituitary stalk. We're gonna try to attempt to preserve the stalk in this case. And then once we come around the tumor, you'll start to see the basilar artery in view. So here's the basilar artery complex, SCA, P1, basilar trunk. Here's the stalk. And then we'll carefully dissect the tumor out. You must resist the temptation of early pulling. You have to ensure that all of the adhesions from the tumor are freed before you uh, deliver the tumor. And here in this case, uh, we've delivered the tumor. Now we'll inspect. Now I've determined that the cyst wall here is gonna to be too difficult to remove. It's actually quite risky and quite deep. So I'm gonna leave this cyst wall behind, but it's nicely fenestrated into the chiasmatic cistern. The stalk and the chiasm has been nicely preserved. And of course, we'll repair this with uh, uh, a duragen inlay followed by a fascia lata overlay and then a nasal septal flap. And I'll typically use a lumbar drain for roughly three to five days postoperatively. I'll start at five cc's an hour and then increase it to 10 cc's an hour if needed. Be careful to avoid over drainage that can cause intracranial hypotension. And then we'll pack it with uh, gel foam soaked in gentamicin and amirasil packing, which we typically will leave in for about 12 days. And our ENT colleagues will remove them in the office afterwards. So here's the post-op scan. You can see the immediate decompression of the chiasm. The vision remained intact. The patient had normal pituitary function since we were able to preserve the stock, had transient DI. And I followed this uh, with an MRI at three months. You can see the cyst wall has shrunk, but uh, I, I felt that the patient would have very high risk of delayed recurrence. So I went ahead and did radiation therapy with IMRT with my radiation oncology colleagues. And you can see at 16 months, you can see further resolution of this cyst wall. So I think in some cases, a combined therapy of near total or maximal safe resection followed by radiation therapy is a very good option for these giant complex craniopharyngiomas. And she's done quite well uh, overall. So when do you use the open approach for cranios? If you look at this tumor, this has quite lateral extension into the sylvian fissure, and it's not quite midline. So in this case, it makes sense to do it through uh, what I prefer, an orbitoterional or modified orbitozygomatic approach. It's just basically a terional that incorporates the orbital rim, and I like to do this in one piece. With a wide splitting of the uh, sylvian fissure, and you can see we have a nice corridor of the tumor that's in the carotid oculomotor triangle. And once the tumor has been removed, you have a nice view of the basilar artery SCA and the big window between the carotid and the third nerve. And, and this is a nice uh, typical window that we, we have. I achieved a near total resection here and treated the tumor adherence that was adherent to the optic nerve with radiotherapy. And, and the patient has done quite well with progression free recurrence for about eight years. Now this is an 80 year old female with this recurrent tumor. She was treated at a, a neighboring hospital by another surgeon with a left terrional approach and that approach rendered her blind in the left eye. It's not uncommon that that happens because an approach from above, there's often a lot of manipulation around the ipsilateral optic nerve that can cause injury. And so she's blind in the left eye. Now she has tumor recurrence going towards the right eye which is her remaining good eye. Uh, another surgeon tried to put an Omaya catheter into this cyst. Uh, 
uh, which was uh, not helpful. It kept getting occluded and the cyst began getting larger and larger and she was referred for radiation therapy. So in this case, um, I felt that she needed a debulking before undergoing definitive radiation therapy. And I debated as to which approach would be better, whether we come in transcranially with another craniotomy or endonasally. And I decided against endonasal only because I felt the cyst wall was lateral, but I also felt that if we're gonna do radiation therapy, we're gonna have to wait three months for the nasoceptal flap to heal uh, because I don't want a delayed breakdown of the repair. So in this case, I thought, what would be the quickest strategy to get her in and out debulked and in and out of the hospital quickly in an 80-year-old female? And so in this case, I decided instead of another craniotomy on the other side, we'll do a transciliary eyebrow approach. And you can see this is the, uh, the small craniotomy, roughly less than four centimeters. And what we'll do is we'll go in transcortically first to come around the cyst wall and decompress the cyst. So here's the cyst wall in the frontal lobe. You can do this transcortically like you're doing an intraaxial tumor and you don't need to use any kind of brain retraction. You can just follow it, decompress the cyst wall and follow it all the way around. But be careful as you get towards the bottom of the cyst wall because you're gonna come and encounter the chiasm. So at that point, we come in subfrontally and open up the arachnoid membrane over the right optic nerve. Now, since this tumor has been operated on several times, there's a lot of adhesions and scar tissue. So you really have to use sharp dissection. I like to use a good pair of micro scissors to really amputate and debulk this tumor. And uh, the tumor planes are often difficult to visualize when there's a lot of adherent scar tissue. So I like to use the uh, arachnoid knife, uh, the apex arachnoid knife, it's the AM22. It's a diamond shaped looking knife. You'll see it in a moment here in the video. But here we're just dissecting the tumor, carefully looking for the ACOM complex. So you don't want to prematurely pull on this tumor and avulse the ACOM complex and avulse the chiasm. So you have to, have to be aware of that. So piecemeal debulking is safe. And this is what we're doing here, just piecemeal debulking so that we can work with a smaller tumor. And here, this is all done without any brain retraction. Again, just piecemeal debulking with a good pair of micro scissors, spreading technique, sharp cutting, no pulling just gentle traction and sharp dissection. Now here's where the tumor is very adherent to the optic nerve. There was no plane here, but I used this uh, arachnoid knife and I cut right along the tumor capsule. And when you cut right along the tumor capsule, you'll free up these dense adhesions, will, which will then mobilize towards the optic nerve. So stay right on the tumor capsule, gentle retraction. We'll eventually come around the top, the top of the tumor and there's the A1. Here's A1 vessel. It was wrapped around A1 and by cutting these membranes sharply, we're able to define these planes and uh, peel it away from the neurovascular structures. So this is all arachnoid knife dissection using that AM22 blade. And then we can carefully uh, remove this dense adherent tumor uh, all with sharp dissection. This is all two-handed microsurgery. And so this was a combined transcortical and subfrontal approach to this recurrent tumor. You can see we've achieved a gross total removal here. Um, and uh, here's the repair, very easy to do. And this patient left the hospital in two to three days. And um, of course, uh, radiographically it looks gross total, but since it's recurred so many times, uh, I had a low threshold to refer her to additional radiation therapy. And she's done very well from this eyebrow approach. So let's talk a little bit about uh, meningiomas. Uh, this is a tuberculum cell meningioma, small to medium size. You can see it's situated between two optic nerves. 
And in this case, I think this is very favorable to do an endonasal approach, these small to medium tumors with optic compression. The advantage here is that you can decompress both optic nerve canals endonasally. Patient had a very nice aerated sphenoid sinus and you can follow the optic nerve canal out to the orbital apex using these angled scopes and using eggshell drilling technique, we can thin down the bone over the planum and tuberculum. And the advantage of doing this endonasally is you can get early devascularization of the tumor using this pistol grip bipolar forceps. We can coagulate the, the dura attachment and devascularize the tumor early. And what we'll do here is open up the dura over the cella and through into the planum with cauterization of the intercavernous sinus. Now with any kind of meningioma surgery, uh, I uh, advise with internal debulking, especially working in this small corridor, you wanna debulk the tumor so that you can collapse the tumor and come around it extra capsularly. Here we see some arachnoid adhesions to a frontal polar artery. So you have to use good sharp dissection with micro scissors to uh, cut these arachnoid bands so you don't injure these small perforating vessels. And then we'll come around the tumor in a counterclockwise fashion and then roll the tumor away. Now, again, it's important to resist the temptation to want to deliver that tumor quickly. Uh, here it looks like it's ready to come out, but if you inspect carefully, it's actually adherent to the diaphragma cella. And if you try to pull on this too early, you can avulse and probably get bleeding from the cavernous sinus. So make sure you find all the dural attachments uh, before you deliver the tumor. And then here you have a nice view of the optic chiasm, ACOM complex. And uh, understand that tuberculum cell meningiomas can have at, as high as an 80% optic canal invasion rate. So I usually use this opportunity to inspect both optic nerve canals to make sure there's no uh, residual tumor hiding there. So this patient had improved vision to 2020 with full visual fields, gross total removal. Here's another example of a larger tumor, tuberculum meningioma with unilateral visual loss. So when you see unilateral visual loss, you have to be aware that this could be a potential cause of optic canal invasion. And indeed, that's what we found. We removed the tumor endonasally. And here we inspected the optic nerve canal and there was some tumor compressing the optic nerve here. And we were able to remove this and publish this technique of how to explore the optic nerve canal using angled scopes. We achieved a gross total removal and the patient left the hospital in two days. And her vision was restored back to normal within a month based on this visual field exam. So when do we consider open approaches for tuberculum meningiomas? Um, in these larger tumors, I look for the uh, spread and the dural attachment. So if you look at the dural attachment here, it's got a wide dural attachment across the skull base. It's got bilateral optic canal invasion, but more importantly, look at the lateral extension here. It extends through the optical carotid triangle and there's some encasement of the ACOM complex. So if there's any vascular encasement, I prefer to do an approach from above because I think it's, uh, it's a little bit easier to handle. And also if you do get into a situation of vascular injury, it's easier to repair any vascular injury with the head open with micronastomosis instruments as opposed to working endonasally where your camera is often filled with blood. So um, in this case, we'll come from an approach from, abo from above. Um, this is a uh, subfrontal approach. So what we'll do is we'll drill off the optic nerve canal and then open up the falciform ligament because this gives you early decompression of the optic nerve. And notice how that right optic nerve is strangulated by the tumor. It's got a brown discoloration, but now it's free. So now we can go ahead and perform our typical meningioma surgery where we debulk the tumor internally. And you have to use a no touch technique to the optic nerve. You don't wanna to touch the optic nerve. You wanna dissect it carefully. And here's the pituitary stock. The pituitary stock is located behind the tumor and then we'll follow the tumor. Here's the other optic nerve. Here's the chiasm. Here's the contralateral optic nerve and be aware of the contralateral carotid artery. It's gonna be situated medial to the optic nerve. So it's very easy to injure if you're not careful or thinking about it. Be aware of that contralateral uh, carotid artery. Uh, 
And uh, here's the basal artery, P1 perforators. And I will uh, put an endoscope in transcranially to take a look around to make sure we haven't left any tumor behind. You can see both optic nerves are nicely decompressed. And then here's the post-op scan, a gross total removal, decompression of the uh, optic nerves. So let's move along down south towards the craniocervical junction, towards the transclival corridor. Here we'll typically see tumors of the bone, such as uh, clivus chordomas or chondrosarcomas. And when we look at this rotund dissection, here you see the basilar artery to the vertebra basilar junction. And notice at this level, this is the level of the floor of the sphenoid sinus. This is a very important landmark when you're doing clival surgery endoscopically. I will use the floor of the sphenoid sinus as a landmark because this divides the upper two thirds of the clivus from the lower one third down to the basion. And we will typically use the vidian nerve canal and follow it because this will take us to the genu of the paraclival petrus carotid to the lacerum segment. So traditionally we have done uh, transmaxillary approaches and sometimes even transmandibular with tongue splitting approaches to get down to these regions. But we've largely abandoned these approaches now with the advent of endoscopic approaches because we can now see widely uh, with the endoscope, the brainstem, the basilar, the paraclival carotid arteries and so forth. So here's an example of a clival chordoma in a child. You can see it's got the classic T2 bright appearance and the impression on the brainstem uh, is very classic. This is called the cortical thumbing sign uh, described by Rick Harnsberger at the University of Utah. And you can see that there's compression of the, the brainstem and this is a midline tumor. So we can do this endonasally. And uh, this soft tumor was hidden behind a big rock of the clivus. The clivus itself was not eroded by tumor. So this required a lot of drilling and excavation of this dense bone. So it's important to use CT angiogram image guidance. You don't want to injure the paraclival carotid arteries when drilling this clivus. So it's important to stay in the midline. And here now we've accessed the gelatinous tumor. This is the typical chordoma looking type tissue and we'll use a side cutting aspirator here to get the tumor out. Now the tumor uh, will typically invade the dura and the dura has two layers. There's a outer periosteal layer of the dura that you see here being held by the pituitary. And then there's a thin uh, arachnoid type membrane, the uh, membranous layer, the inner layer of the dura, which we see here. Now, in this case, uh, I decided to just resect the outer layer of the dura and leave the inner layer of dura behind. I didn't feel that there was tumor here and I didn't want to risk a high flow CSF leak. Uh, I know some people will argue to be very aggressive here and resect the entire dura. But in this case, I was a little bit more conservative and I repaired it with an alloderm since there was no intraoperative CSF leak. And we had a nice decompression of the brainstem and the patient went on to get proton beam radiotherapy. Now, in this case of chordoma, this one invaded through both layers of the dura, in which case we had to resect the entire dura. And I'll show you here. The patient presented with right-sided ophthalmoplegia. You can see there's right cavernous sinus invasion of the tumor. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll debulk the tumor that's in the sphenoid sinus and then follow the tumor up to the gland. So the gland is here. And it, this gives us a nice landmark of where we're working. And oftentimes, if the tumors are soft and suckable, you can just follow the tumor into the cavernous sinus. So here's the tumor that was going into the cavernous sinus. We simply just follow it. And then what we'll do after we've decompressed the cavernous sinus, we'll go ahead and resect the clival dura. And there's the basilar artery. Here's the basilar trunk. And then using sharp dissection, we'll cut out a rectangular defect of the dura. Be careful of where the sixth nerve is running. You don't want to cut the sixth nerve while you're doing this. So you have to always inspect. And then here, now that the dura has been cut out, we'll look at, there's the left sixth nerve. There's the basilar artery. And we're using a 30 degree angled scope looking out into the corners. And then we'll look for the contralateral sixth nerve. Here's the contralateral sixth nerve on the right side, 
brainstem and basal artery. And now we're left with a uh, high flow CSF leak. Uh, we'll repair this in a multi-layered fashion with gel foam as an inlay. And then uh, we put fascia lata as an overlay with a fat graft to prevent any pontine herniation. And then a nasal septal flap with Miracel packing to pack off the sphenoid sinus defect. And so here's the uh, post-op scan. You can see a gross total removal and the patient went on to get proton beam radiotherapy. Here's another example of a chordoma. This is a lower chordoma in the craniocervical junction. This was resected by ENT surgeon transorally. And unfortunately the patient did not get proton radiotherapy and this recurred within a year. But notice the T2, how there's T2 signal along the anterior longitudinal ligament. This is tumor seeding by the chordoma, which is very classic of recurrences. So we have to get to an approach that gets to the top of the tumor, but also accesses uh, C2 and C3 of the upper cervical spine. So traditionally, you can consider a transmandibular transglossal approach, splitting the tongue and the mandible to get this wide access, but that can be quite morbid. But why not consider a multi-corridor approach with transnasal, transoral, and transcervical combined, a multi-corridor approach. This is indeed what we did. We started with a neck incision, much like we do for an anterior cervical discectomy, get right down on the anterior longitudinal ligament, and you can excise that ligament that has the pearls of tumor. These are the pearls of the tumor recurrences. <clears throat> and then we'll come in transorally. You can see the tumor is displacing the soft palate and uvula anteriorly. And then we'll come in endonasally where we can get to the top of the tumor and get control over the superior aspect of the tumor, work in all three corridors to remove this tumor. And then by the end of the resection, we can place an, uh, a suction through the endonasal corridor and visualize it through the transoral corridor. So you can see that all three corridors have been combined and we can get this nice complete removal. And the patient went on to get proton radiotherapy and has been progression free for the last five years now. Now, when you see a patient like this, this is a patient who had an oral mass, has a wing scapula, right tongue atrophy and dysphagia and dysphonia. This is Vernet syndrome. There's cranial nerves nine through 12 palsies on the right. He's got weight loss because he can't swallow. And he's got this film. He's got this big chordoma in the craniocervical junction with brainstem compression. And you would think, maybe I can do this through an endonasal approach. It looks midline, but make sure you look at all aspects of the imaging. Notice how this is quite lateral and it compresses the brainstem. This invades the jugular foramen and has a large component in the neck in the parapharyngeal space. I think this is much easier done through a open lateral approach. It's important to study the CT scan as well. You can see the tumors eroded the lower clivus and it's also eroded the entire occipital condyle. So the patient is already unstable and will require an occipital cervical stabilization. So here in this case, we'll do this through an extended far lateral transcondylar transjugular approach. Uh, this is the cartoon showing the exposure. This is much like an approach I would do for a glomus jugulari tumor where you have full access of the high cervical carotid, the lower cranial nerves, and the jugular bulb through a transmastoid infralabyrinthine approach. So here we're doing the infralabyrinthine mastoidectomy. We're skeletonizing the sigmoid sinus. The tumor has completely eroded the occipital condyle and we're resecting the tumor that's in the occipital condyle and then skeletonizing the V3 segment of the vertebral artery. Now we'll use a fallopian bridge technique where we preserve the facial nerve, the mastoid segment in its bony canal to minimize injury. And we'll tie off the internal jugular vein and open up the sigmoid sinus sharply and occlude the sigmoid sinus intraluminally with a piece of gel foam. We can then inject surgiflow distally to prevent backfilling from the inferior petrosal sinus and this allows us to now safely resect the lateral wall of the sigmoid sinus and start removing tumor that's in the jugular bulb. So here's the tumor in the jugular bulb. We'll now access the tumor that's in the parapharyngeal space. 
will resect the carotid artery laterally and then debulk the tumor with an ultrasonic aspirator and also a side cutting aspirator to get the tumor that's in the neck. We can then follow the jugular vein up to the jugular foramen and resect the remainder of the jugular vein. And now we'll remove that tumor that's in the lower clivus. We now have this huge access to the craniocervical junction where we can now drill off the remainder of the occipital condyle, access that tumor that's right at C1 and C2. And in this case, we did not have to transpose the vertebral artery to get to this area because the tumor has already created such a large corridor where I can now drill off the top of that clivus. And here's the tip of the odontoid right at the suction tip. I can now drill the tip of the odontoid process without any vertebral transposition. Now we'll go ahead and go intradurally. And here's the tumor being dissected off of the vertebral artery. Here's the ipsilateral V4 segment. We'll protect the vertebral artery and dissect the tumor. These are the lower cranial nerves. Now understand that these nerves are dysfunctional. They've already are impaired and not working. So you can divide these to get the tumor out. And then we'll go ahead and debulk the rest of this tumor up to the clival dura where we then resect the remainder of the clival dura. So we're now visualizing the vertebral basilar junction, brainstem with a large dural defect that needs to be repaired using a multi-layer technique. It's important to occlude the entrance of the middle ear with bone wax and sometimes bone cement so you don't get CSF rhinorrhea. And we'll use a fat graft that's bolstered with a Medpore Titan plate. And then here's the post-op scan, a complete gross total removal and occipital cervical fusion at a second stage and uh, a great neurological outcome for this patient. So can we do spine surgery through the nose? Uh, in cases of basilar invagination, we have to resect C1 and C2. And so we can do this through an endonasal approach. This is a, a great approach for basilar invagination. Here's an example of a patient with clipophile syndrome with basilar invagination. We've opened up the sphenoid sinus and we start uh, dissecting the mucosa from the floor of the sphenoid sinus down to the basion. And now we can visualize the C1 arch. Now notice how the C1 arch in this case is assimilated to the clivus because of the clipophile syndrome. So you have to drill off C1 and the lower clivus to access the odontoid. It's important not to go too lateral, so you don't want to violate the uh, lateral masses of C1 and, 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 um, and resect too much of that. There will always be a soft tissue panis that's between C1 and C2. So this is what you see here, a soft tissue panis. We'll go ahead and resect it with a kerosene rangeur. And then when you visualize the odontoid process, you want to hollow it out like a canoe using eggshell technique. And as you eggshell it, the, uh, the soft tissue will then re-expand below that eggshell. You, don't, uh, you wanna be careful to out-fracture it before putting a big keras in there. And once you identify the dural sac, uh, you can carefully resect the transverse ligament and the rest of the ligaments. So you want to see reinflation of that dural sac uh, because that will signify that you've adequately decompressed the brainstem. And so, in the absence of any CSF leak, you don't have to do any fancy repair. I typically will just put a piece of gel foam and some Surgicel and a little fibrin glue. And this area will remucosalize itself uh, you know, in a matter of a week or so. And so you don't need a nasal septal flap for this type of uh, procedure. So here's the post-op scan, decompression of the craniocervical junction. And I also want to touch base about JNAs. These are nasopharyngeal angiofibromas. This is a 14-year-old boy uh, with this large tumor. Uh, you can come in endonasally or you can come in transmaxillary. And in this case, we did a pure endonasal approach. We do a mucosal sparing septectomy where you can incise the mucosa, resect the septum so you can get good binostral access but you can repair that mucosa so you don't violate the nasal septum. So you get a nasal septal perforation. And so the, 
we, we embolize these with uh, preoperative embolization, but it's also important to access the blood supply early. So here we are accessing the infratemporal fossa. We've opened up that fat pad and uh, we coagulated that sphenopalatine internal maxillary artery. And these tumors are benign and they'll have a nice capsule and they'll typically erode into little nooks and crannies of the skull base. And here there's a small finger of tumor going into the inferior orbital fissure. So we'll look for that fat pad and dissect the tumor capsule away from the fat and away from the pterygoid plate. So there's tumor lateral to the pterygoid plate. Here's the tumor in the infratemporal fossa. And then once you've devascularized it, you can uh, debulk it with a side cutting aspirator. And in these large tumors, I'll typically cut them into pieces, into little components. So here's the component that's in the nasal cavity. This is the midline component coming out the nostril. And then the rest of the tumor is in that back of the nasopharynx and it's too large to bring up through the nose. So what I've done here is I've pushed the tumor into the oral cavity, grabbed it with a ring forceps and there's the tongue. So this tumor is quite large. It's too big to come out through the nose. So we'll push it downwards and, and deliver it through the oral cavity. And that's a, that's a nice strategy. Here's the infratemporal fossa resection bed. There's the oral pharynx, nasopharynx. And uh, the, we can put the septum back and uh, suture the nasal mucosa using a straight needle in a quilted like pattern. And this gives you a nice repair of the nasal septum uh, and so forth. So here's the post-op scan, complete removal of this large JNA. So uh, my concluding thoughts, um, the endoscopic and the nasal approach is an important tool in our armamentarium for the skull-based surgeon. It's just a tool. And patient selection is very important for success. And it may not be the optimal approach for all patients and all pathologies. So we have to be tailors and tailor the strategy and the treatment to each individual patient. And I think in this day and age, we have to have expertise in all approaches, both open and endoscopic in contemporary skull base surgery. Sometimes you have to use both approaches and use a multi-corridor strategy. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Okay, very good. Quality presentation, excellent pictures and uh, study, imaging studies. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Rasin Agaev. He's a neurosurgical resident from Kazan, Russia, that will moderate. Hello, Rasin. Just unmute yourself there. Let me. Hello, everyone. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rasin. Oh, hello. My name is Rasim. Thank you for moderating. Okay, Rasim, are you going to moderate? Yes, uh, today I will be moderating for all of you. Okay, perhaps we misunderstood. Anyways, let me take over, Rasim. Um, uh, any questions or comments from the panelists? We have a few here today. Just step right up. Excuse me, I have a question. Go ahead. Hey, Dr. James, uh, can you tell, uh, tell me uh, how is the fistula after this uh, surgery? Because it's very, with, do you have very open uh, in the uh, clevus? The, the fistula is very important problem. Yeah, so I, I think that your question is the rate of CSF leakage through the clivus approach, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly an, a risk factor. And <clears throat> I think with transclival approaches, you can have up to, you know, a 10% CSF leak rate in some series. So I, I think it's very important to use a multi-layered repair. Um, you know, I typically like to use uh, a duragen as an inlay as the first layer, and then fascia lata as the second layer. And then uh, once that's covered, you put fat graft into the clivus defect because that fat will help prevent the pons from being pushed out by the CSF pressures. And then your last layer is the nasoceptal flap, which I think is a very robust uh, 
repair technique. And then I'll use a lumbar drain for about three to five days. And typically that strategy is, will, will work. I mean, obviously sometimes you can get CSF leak and you have to be prepared for that. But, um, you know, CSF leak is certainly always a risk when you're doing endonasal surgery. So your repair technique, uh, you know, has to have good coverage and um, the flap should be adherent to the bone of the skull base. So you have to make sure you remove all of the mucosa that's on the skull base bone so that you have naked bone touching the uh, periosteal side of the flap. So that will adhere and then prevent any flap dehiscence. Obviously, if you have, if the flap dies or, or, or you have persistent leakage, there's other strategies to try to repair that. But, um, but normally that's my, my method of repair for these. Okay, very good. Next comment or question from the panel? Uh, uh, Jim, Jim so, okay. go ahead. Uh, James, I'm Dr. Vinod Felix from Kerala. Have a Yeah, James, did an excellent presentation, right? You actually covered a vast uh, area of approach from cryptoform plate down till the odontoid. And uh, I would like to ask, in trans-odontoid approach, if you have a CSF leak, how are you going to manage it? Are you going to play? Because at times you don't have a flap, and the swallowing makes the, when you keep on swallowing also, the repair is going to move. So how are you going to close the CSF leak in a trans odontoid approach? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I've encountered some of these leaks intraoperatively. So you have to determine what kind of leak is it. So if it's just a pinhole in the dura, you have to try to plug that pinhole. Now, I'll, I'll sometimes use a small piece of alloderm to try to just plug that pinhole, put some surgicel over it, and then you can use a fascia lata as, a, as another layer if you want to, and then the nasoceptal flap, and then a lumbar drain. Um, what I found is that when you flip these patients over for the occipital cervical fusion, being in the prone position makes them leak during the fusion. So what I'll typically do is flip them back and then reinspect the repair after they've had their fusion. Because if you don't look again, um, they're probably leaking in the prone position. So you have to make sure you take a look once you flip them back supine. Okay, very good. Kawhi, you have a question or comment? Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation, Dr. James. Uh, I have two questions. First question is uh, when you do this in the EEA approach, uh, when you do this uh, repair, uh, did you suture this aficionata back to this, uh, back to the dura, or just put it on, on the dura? Yeah, I, I don't do a suturing technique. I know you, you can with special, you know, devices and instruments, but typically we will just use it as an onlay repair. Uh, okay. Uh, my second question then, uh, for some GH adenoma, uh, some authors uh, are required to remove the medial wall of the cavernous centers, uh, centers to prevent, to, to get the, uh, the biochemical remission. So what's your opinion? Do you remove the medial wall of this uh, uh, I don't routinely do it. It really depends on the individual tumor. So if you, obviously, if the tumor is invading the cavernous sinus, uh, you can consider that. But typically, when the tumors invade the cavernous sinus, um, they're more challenging to cure. But if you follow the pseudo capsule of the tumor and it preserves the integrity of the medial wall, I don't think it's necessary to always resect the medial wall. It adds additional surgical time and it also adds additional risk to the patient. So um, that's my philosophy. Okay, thank you. Okay, very good. We have a question from a panelist, Rasin Agayev from Kazan, Russia. Has COVID changed your planning for pituitary tumor and cranial pharyngioma? Um, I, I think our situation was a little bit unique in New Jersey. Um, a lot of our hospitals were incredibly overwhelmed with COVID patients where even doing time sensitive surgeries was quite challenging. So there was a number of pituitary tumor patients who had optic compression that we had to wait. And it was, um, it was challenging, you know, we had to monitor their visual status carefully <clears throat> because 
there was really a lack of ICU beds and lack of ventilators to even accommodate for these patients. We were only doing trauma patients um, who were in life and death situation. And obviously pituitary tumor patients weren't in that life and death situation, but we're, we've slowly flattened the curve and we're actually starting to do more pituitary surgeries now. So hopefully, hopefully uh, we're getting through that period, but it was, um, it was quite challenging to do that. Okay, more comments and questions from the panel? Step up, now's your chance. Sorry, just, just as a follow-up to that question, um, I'm from Cape Town and we were struggling with the idea of how to start doing pituitaries ourselves. Have you changed anything in your approach? Have you started um, to not use a drill and perhaps use a, just a chisel? Um, is there any way to make the approach safer for the operating team? Um, or are you trying to go about it as, as usual? Well, I, I think the first thing is to do pre-op testing in these patients if you can. So if they're COVID negative, then I've been doing standard approach with drilling and so forth. Uh, obviously, with if they're COVID positive, you may want to consider delaying the surgery unless obviously it's a surgical emergency like pituitary apoplexy. Um, there have been uh, recent publications that have come out with uh, special drapes that have been developed um, and, and taking a look at which risk factor increases aerosolization. Certainly drilling, I think, is going to be the highest risk. Uh, one thing that I would consider is using a double barrel suction irrigation, um, similar to what ENT otologists use for temporal bone drilling. I think that gives you constant irrigation so you get less risk of bone aerosolization. Um, but yeah, but if you can try to kerosene the, uh, the bone, that's also another option to minimize that. I prefer to drill. Um, you know, I think you can, you can try to use certain drapes to minimize that spread of the, the aerosols. Okay, um, I have a question from JC Alcada Zen, do you perform routine COVID RT PCR patients as pre-op for all EE cases? Yeah, it's been standard routine of all the hospitals now to pre-op test uh, patients for COVID prior to them entering the surgical suite. Okay. Okay. More comments, questions from the panel? Step up, this platform is meant to be interactive. And I doubt if you're gonna have much of a chance to sit down with Dr. Liu. <laughs> well, I guess everyone's quiet today. Uh, okay, Dr. Liu, I think, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for the excellent presentation and uh, we're gonna edit this and send it to you. And thank you for all the panelists for coming. Okay. Great. Thank you, Have John. a great day. Have a great day. Okay. Have a good day.